It really is. Um, you, I think of it top down and bottom up, and you know, as, as you were saying, the user experience and how does the actual tenant enhance the space. But as we're seeing, it's it's from the top down. You know, <clears throat> there was a recent study in uh, spring of this year by Deloitte about the things that keep executives up at night, and the number one issue is human capital. So how do we enable people to have the best choice and flexibility because we're going from a workplace to a work platform. Mm -hmm. And the space is part of this ecosystem of how we're providing for these solutions for everybody. And, and, and to your point, one of the things that we've done within our own portfolio is we've kind of done a, what we call a minimal viable product. So how can you take the existing footprint, not change the walls, not change the doors, uh, reconfigure your furniture to enable what brings people together? So collaboration uh, with some support with touchdown and things like that, because to your point, nobody knows how this is going to change over the next six months. Yeah. Unfortunately, real estate and, and design, physical design is still tied to very costly long-term projects. And so I have a lot of empathy for leaders who are delaying, delaying, because yeah. they don't feel like they have enough data to really commit to anything yet. So what is that, you know, what's the short-term solve? You know, of like a little bit of band-aids and glue, but it also, I think, sets companies up for a really, in my mind, exciting opportunity of yeah. the workplace and the workplace experience. So not just the built environment, but just, that, like I said, that experience of being an employee, you, it's a beta. So that means you're iterating and improving and evolving just the way that like we get app updates for, you know, every single thing that's on our phone and they tell us, hey, on this release, these things are new. And you know we can start to use that as a change management pipeline. And it used to be that everything was an alpha. Every time you build a space, exactly. it was an alpha. Exactly. You had to bring the iPhone, design the iPhone in its entirety day one. And That'd now it. it's now how do we do the smaller iterations to adjust space? And the other thing that we need to get better about as an industry is how do we collect information about what's effective for people, yeah. not just what they want, but what they say they want. Because as you go back to Margaret Mead. What people say, what people do, what they say they do are all three different things. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's such a great point. Like, what brings people to the office? It's the interaction with their employees. It's the collaboration. So it's like, how how are we able to be flexible in the space that we're building? Yeah. Like, we could build something that works day one, but it's actually working five years. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you know, we're looking at a lot of like, you know, furniture can things that can move around, that can switch out, that we could like get rid of, you know, buy more of, and you know, it doesn't harm the walls, doesn't build yeah. the building partitions, that sort of thing. So, you know, we're thinking what's good short term, what's good long term, yeah. what's the flexibility with that? Okay. Yeah, flexibility is key. I mean, it's one of the things that really was one of the catch rates that came straight out of code. It was, you know, no more we do rows of desks, we have to be flexible. Um, we were, uh, took something you said the other day that was really interesting about, um, you know, it's no longer about what's in the chair, is it? It's about how are we going to use this space, and it's not we have to pack, you know, a hundred sit-stand desks in this space. We need it to be able to work with the, with the teams when they come in. How are they going to work? Are they going to collaborate? Are they going to, you know, pull the furniture apart, reconfigure it um, while they're there, or is it something that we're going to reconfigure for an event? Is it something that we're going to reconfigure for a period of time and experiment with it? Um, one of the interesting things, Tiffany, you guys are doing a lot in amenities, aren't you? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of our tenants are, you know, re-looking at their real estate and there's still a lot of space types and a lot of, you know, um, world types that are in their, like, kit of parts, but they don't want to necessarily put it in within, within their real estate, you know, footprint. And, you know, it's a lot of spaces like training rooms, like large conference rooms, like spaces for town halls, um, that sort of thing that is, you know, that they use at like a handful of times a year. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of conversations we have with, with our tenants, that's a lot of things they're asking for, and, you know, we look at our assets one by one, and we're like, okay, how can we implement this many that most of our tenants in this neighborhood um, are looking for, and, you know, a lot of what we're building is a response, a direct response to what tenants are asking for. Yeah. And did you find that, Joe? Um, so, Joe, he's coming over from the dealer side. <laughs> I was going to say from the dark side, but he'll <laughs> join, join us and bring some assets from the West Coast. But you know, when you were in your dealer role, even your meetings that you've had this past week, you know, what insights? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think uh, 
what we thought prior to the pandemic of what an asset was, like the gaming tables and all the fun things. That it's not it. it there's more to getting people back into the office. But um, one thing I think is exciting, and I'm not sure if you all are seeing the same, is to see people ready to take some leaps and just be humble enough to know that we don't know exactly if this is going to be a hit or a miss, but to take the first step and just acknowledge that we're, we're going to do something and we're, we're hoping it works out. If not, we're going to take the lesson learned and, and move forward. This is a great opportunity for experimentation that we have not had since Action Office was invented in 1971. <laughs> Think about that. When have you ever had all of your expectations ripped out of how we work every day? Right now, the standard is working from home, so going to the office is a change. Even if, if you go back to the same old thing that you provided before, you're going to uninspire people. Um, you know, Lenny Boudoin, who works for CBRE, had a really great quote, and he said, the biggest amenity of the space is the people. That's the glue of the culture that brings people together, but we're New Yorkers. So we expect all the different things that we're going to have. So we expect for Phil to have all the food service in the basement and the meeting area for us to meet as a big group because we don't want to pay for that as part of our individual daily overhead. We want to pay for those services as we need it. And that's how organizations are looking at some agility in terms of their portfolio. Can I downsize this because I don't have to do these other things? Yeah, so that, that's an end. No, go no, on, Joe. No, I was just going to say, I think for me, it was interesting. Immediately when the pandemic started on Spotify, there was a playlist for like a coffee shop where you could hear the background of the noise. And for me, it was like, where's the hum of the office? Yeah. So that's what, like, yeah. just to hear the background noise of other people talking and that kind of energized me to work. And I miss out a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. I think that it's under times, but the biggest competitor we have today is the home office. You know, so as real estate leaders, as we look at spaces and say, okay, how are we going to draw people back in? Actually, now, to add on to what you're saying about people being the amenity, the office is the amenity, isn't it? Like, this is why I'm coming in. And I was telling Joe this morning, it's you know, being able to be in the office next to your colleagues, you can make a decision in two minutes on something that you don't have 15 emails about. You just say, yeah, this is how we're going to do it. Or, yeah, this is what we're working on. Um, you just need that, don't you? Because otherwise you get in this trench and you begin to wonder. So how do you see that? And as you, people are a big push pull, isn't it? Yeah, it is a big push pull because again, we're competing with something that is where we have virtually been for the past now two, almost two and a half years. Um, it's also where people can, you know, in 15 minutes cook themselves a meal in their kitchen with all their stuff. And like, there's a, there's a lot to compete against, but I think where, uh, we, I think where companies will see more success is rather than saying, okay, we are hybrid, which is still even a word that I think we should tease out. Um, if we're going to be hybrid, we should be hybrid around certain activities, not certain days where it's just monolithically you need to be in the office. So like companies that are setting standards for when we have meetings or when we have workshops that are upwards of like five people and fewer than, you know, maybe 15 just for the sake of efficiency or efficiency. We like our standards recommend that you come into the office and book this kind of a room or this kind of a space. And we, we can work with our landlord and have food services and whatever sort of like facilitation tools you might need. And you're coming in for that. How you choose to then spend the rest of your day is freestyle. If it makes sense for you to be in the office to have that, you know, random interaction with people because that, you know, that inherently does feel good. Great, go for it. But if you have a doctor appointment or just, you know, you know you get your best heads down work at home, you're not, there really shouldn't be anything stopping you. So I think the next iteration of hybrid or flexibility we're going to start to see is around the activities that take place and where they take place most successfully. There's some really good research from Leesman who talked yeah. about what what activities are better suited in the office versus at the home. Yep. And, you know, you, the, the theory is that you have total control of your environment in the home. Mm -hmm. You determine the temperature, you determine the glare. If you don't like it, you have total accessibility to change right. it. Where in the office, you do have some structure to it. And so those things are really better suited for things that are around collaboration and more, uh, more individual kind of one-on-ones. But if you need to focus, stay home. Like, it's okay. Now, that doesn't hold true for all geographic locations. You know, yeah. New York City, you might have 
three people sharing an apartment and the ability to focus is just not there. You might have two kids in your apartment and you're trying to be in daycare. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So, you know, it's all, uh, there's a lot of specifics around geography, but, but, but to your point, today, I, I've been here today, I'm going to take the flow to train home because it's off peak, so I don't have to pay the premium for a peak train. Yep. But I have the autonomy of choice. You get more of the seat. Yeah, I get there. <laughs> and then I log on when I get home and I, I keep on working, you know, because we have the autonomy of choice now. Yeah. And I think like, moving more in that direction doesn't feel as, uh, antagonistic to employees and I think that's the thing that we're seeing a lot of companies struggle with right now is they're setting these daily flexibility like daily the day flexibility programs and people are like it, there's no, it feels arbitrary to people whereas doing the research to say you know we're pulling from Leesman you know who is in that with like a uni universal standard for workplace data tells us that X happens better when we're in the office this happens, you know, you know, one on ones can happen wherever, but we recommend that you don't go more than three meetings without meeting with the person in, in like face to face, like things like that, because then that's just a map where people can then still choose their own adventure, but it still gives the company the structure of, you know, we can manage our human capital, we can figure out how to still make the space that we have invested lots and lots of money into worthwhile both for, for our PL's sake and for our people's sake. So there's, you know, meeting people more in the middle on like the programming piece, I think is the next frontier, which I hope yeah. for. <laughs> and that's so crucial too for like the younger generation of people yeah. starting out, you know, their yeah. careers. You know, you mentioned like some people are having roommates and they where really we have a lot of like head down space where you can actually get like productive work done. So they really, you know, I'm finding talking to some colleagues that are just like want to go back to the yeah. office, but also, like, how can they be productive with team members who are you know, more manager level right. or senior level that are capable, of, you know, working on their own? But like, how do we train the younger generation yeah. as well? Yeah, so, yeah. that can be like another piece of the programming of like today is just mentoring day. You're in the like you're in the office or like you're in for the first half half like half of the day, and don't expect to get much done. But like you're in there to get face to face with people who you have been spending time with on Zoom or you haven't had a chance to meet with or you know something that might help with your professional development. Like those are things that companies need to start designing for is like those specific activities, not just work activities, but social activities too. Yeah, the policies that really reinforce how you work. I've heard of some organizations doing Zoom free days mm -hmm. that force people to come in and, and, and look each other in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, we haven't done this in two and a half years. But it's like, how do you get that social cohesiveness? Because that's what CEOs are they're really concerned about is, how do I get my culture back in my company? I, I survived this dynamic environment for the last two and a half years. But if I don't have that, that, that stickiness factor that draws people in, how am I going to attract and retain the best? Yeah. So they're really thinking about the culture aspect of how that impacts yeah. their, um, their human capital. Yeah, and then I think the job of you know people who are in workplace that straddle the people and space side yeah. is to coach those leaders into thinking, the space is a, a platform for culture. It is not the only location where culture exists. Culture's been happening this whole time. Companies really need to think about their digital culture, correct? Just as much as their their, their space culture, yeah. because it's only part of the ecosystem. And you need to think about it holistically, yeah. In the, the ecosystem, and that's exactly how right. the culture impacts all these different areas. Yeah, and you know, I say this as a WeWork alumni, but like, you know, I think we the WeWork WeWorkification of this, the workplace leading into the pandemic really put mega emphasis on culture happens in the built environment of like the snacks and you can bring your dog and you can wear jeans and you know whatever the thing is but that's only one figment of what culture actually looks like culture begins you know the day that you apply for a job to the day that you hand in your laptop and your badge so there's a lot more than just you being in a physical space that happens between then and the beginning and the end so yeah, that actually is sorry, also we work on my side yes I <laughs> Um, one of the interesting things is is how do we create though that equitable experience? Because like one of the, one of the comments that we often get is especially you know graduates they want to get in you know everybody wants to turn up at Goldman Sachs make sure your you know, face is in front of your manager and 
how do we create that ethical experience with hybrid working where you don't feel like you're getting left out, but you still feel like you know, I'm accomplishing what I need to accomplish. I'm coming in on the days. And as you were mentioning before, Karen, they're, they may say come in on Tuesday. I can't because I've got a doctor's appointment, but happy to come in on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Yeah. So how do you create that? I, I would say it's really going to be about designing around the activities that people are doing because then that sets a whole company standard where I'm seeing a little bit of a scary slip of hope is when companies are just like it's up to the manager's discretion. That right there immediately creates an equity and it's purely based on the subjective feelings of any given manager and how they feel about you know line of sight management versus I'm good with being like a free range manager and I trust that you'll get your work done when you do. Um, I, I think that's where companies can, I think that's where companies should step in and create the sort of behavior guidelines and activity guidelines to say these are for everyone and then how your team uses them in terms of you know maybe the finance team isn't going to need as many workshops as the creative team but like how do we make sure you know come up with <laughs> just the same way that we have design like those environment and design kit of parts we should have behavior kit of parts and say like you should have you know even if your team doesn't need workshop settings, we recommend you guys get together and just think about what your team needs for, you know, next 30, 60, 90, and like get lunch and spend time with one another, have it be, you know, more of an interactive and interactive situation than, you know, a, a town hall or a, uh, you know, just a roundup of updates from, you know, that everyone just like, you know, passes the baton around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. For some reason, it just happened, but um, there's a product out there called Donut. Oh, yeah. <coughs> and it really tries to connect people from either different parts of the organization. So yeah. that cohesiveness of bringing people together yeah. is really critical. Totally. And I think there's, there's some interesting products that are, you know, getting incubated right now around how do we even take something like that a step further and connect people based on, like, skill sharing. Like, what do you know that I need to know? Or what do you know that I'd like to now know? And then is there a relationship or some sort of just dynamic that can be perpetuated beyond a single coffee and things like that? And so there are tools that are coming up that can be part of your engagement uh, sort of network, for lack of a better word, of just, you know, this yeah. is one of those, one of the th features of a larger strategy and a larger uh, platform of tools. Yeah, that social network analysis of how you bring people together. Exactly. Right? How, do you, how does big data flow into that? And how do you actually quantify that in a way that's, that's can contribute to enhancing them versus being big brother? Exactly. That, that's the that's big, always that, the fine line. And what's happening right now in technology there's so many new tools that are being developed. There's there's so much money being dumped into uh, prop tech right now. And HR tech. Okay. Yeah, and HR tech too. Um, to, to really create new tools for how do we connect people together because everybody is struggling with the same dynamic. Yeah. And I think, you know, we what, we're, we, what we are all sort of learning together in real time is those tools enable, but they are not the full answer. Yeah. And I think that was a misconception that because we were busy and focusing on a million other things at once, and now every because it's such a big problem, we're all focused on this, is that tools will enable, they will not be the silver bullet. No. It still comes down to people and culture. And the strategy framework of like what are we why are we acquiring this and what is it going to do for us and how are we going to measure the success of it? Like, and then how does the space support it? Exactly. But again, it's an ecosystem, not a workplace. Yep. It's a great platform. Yeah. So it needs each other to work together, doesn't it? Like each piece of it actually has to work. Yeah. Otherwise, if yeah. one is weak or, you know, one, yeah. you know, as I think we had it's a, a three legged stool. I think at um, WorkTech, when they were talking about a center, they said, if you come in here to their new meeting, yeah. um, or one Manhattan West, if you come in here and say the greatest thing about it is the view, we completely failed this Right. <laughs> Like, because it's the design. So for those who don't know, that, that was incredible. incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, and the view is absolutely awesome. It should not be like, it should knock your socks up. So, like, that's a high standard. Yeah, and that was the standard they went for, yeah. was they want you to come in and it's about the space and it's about the people. But I'd really like to open this up to the um, audience. If anybody has questions, feel free to uh, 
raise them, or if there's anybody online that would like to ask a question, please do so. Alex will feed it over to us. <laughs> but while we wait for questions, um, I do, I definitely think one of the interesting things with hybrid, this whole idea of hybrid working is as new challenges, as COVID 4.4 or whatever we're coming, <laughs> turns up, um, Omnicron variant. It's an app update. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> we have to meet these challenges in our workplaces. People do want a sense of normalcy. But then you also get the geopolitical side. You get, you know, inflation's up. Do I want to stay home instead of paying, you know, $5 a gallon for gas or in Joe's case, six or seven bucks? Yeah. 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 You can take some back to you in California. You know, I don't know how much it will cost you to get back with it. Um, but that is a, that's a challenge. And so again, these are almost like conflicting things about bringing people back into the office. Yeah. Um, where do we go from here, Andy? So I was listening this morning to a podcast called Pivot. And uh, it's it? <laughs> it's the best. Um, but uh, one of the things he was saying was that we might be up for a rude awakening, where right now everything is about <clears throat> attraction and retention of new employees. Um, and there's going to be a reckoning uh, with if we do go into a recession of, you know, companies are being looking at their human capital and there may not be as much opportunity there and it might force different things in the work environment. Um, and so with the bottom line that I took away from that whole conversation was the need for business agility. How does the space support business agility? And that's the bottom line. How do I reconfigure my space? How do I give it a future without having to reinvent the wheel? How can I um, create space within a space that could be repurposed because my capex is going to be limited yeah. regardless. Everybody's struggling to keep their, their overhead budget much more in line with uh, you know industry standards uh, and you're competing for human capital dollars. So you're either talking about the rate resignation where you're trying to attract new people or you're talking about a recession where you just don't have capital anymore and those capital dollars you're competing with those when you're talking about projects. So it's the agility that allows companies to expand and contract. And so things like Brookfield that can provide a lot of these large amenity spaces and, and some of these things that you don't have to have in your portfolio that you can tap into. These are the kind of things that are going to be really compelling for organizations moving forward. Really interesting. So looking at you know, you some of the properties that we've worked in with you, um, absolutely gorgeous. You know, is it 225 Liberty? Yeah, 225 Liberty, we just finished. Yeah, just finished. Um, then we have one project, have one that had one last. Yeah, so. and just the, the space, you know, I might not be able to afford a 15 year lease, but on a space like that, I'm flexible. I have all the amenities in the building, um, and I still can attract talent, but without being completely, you know, tied down to a specific space. And I think that's one of the things that we're looking at is you, know, you do, you, you hit a recession, you hit speed bumps along the way. Feels like the last two years we've hit brick walls, not just mm -hmm. speed bumps. But um, that being said, there's always room for change and growth. And I think, you know, if you didn't come out of this without some of the positive, then it's all for. But we're getting there. Um, but what do you see? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it, adaptability because all the, adaptability and flexibility are really still the two core pillars of what I think are coming out of the pa pandemic. The flexibility is for the people and the adaptability is for the programming, the systems, the spaces, all these things that enable that. Um, and it was interesting listening to Pivot this morning of like, you know, human capital is always going to be the most expensive thing on a company's balance sheet. The second thing is always going to be real estate. And so how are they, they're, are always going, they're always going to be looking at the efficiency play on both, unfortunately. But with this, I think we're at the beginning of the trend of more and more landlords taking those shared amenities on as managed space for them. It does lighten the load for companies. It does make being in their environments more compelling because that's a pay as you go model. Yeah. Um, and so, like you know, it office also is a service. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's office as a service. And so, how do, that that does then free up a little bit more capital, or maybe create a little bit more of a safety buffer for that human capital efficiency play. Yeah. Um, and it's again, it's not a disposal of space. It is 
handing the management back to an, an operator rather than it being just an occupier. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. And hopefully those two things will uh, benefit each other because I think the other thing too with landlords owning that space is then that also can open it up to anyone to use those spaces. Obviously creating priority structures for folks that are in the building or in the portfolio, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, people can just rent space, whether they are local, whether they are flying in and they need to hold a board meeting for whatever reason. It just makes space accessible on a more uh, communal scale uh, without necessarily sacrificing on the price because it's a one-time thing rather than an ongoing investment. The, the other thing that I've heard about too is just thinking about this flexibility, you know, the, the metaverse of the office is mm -hmm. out there. Um, there's a couple apps out there that are companies that are doing it already, but how true is that? It's kind of clunky right now. It's kind of like a little, if you think, remember um, <coughs> Mario Karts or something back in the day. Yeah. It's kind of like that. It's like Sims, yeah. But that's okay. It's all good. Um, it's, Everyone has like an avatar, right? Right. Yeah. And you're like connected into totally. like a virtual. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but some companies, because of this, are thinking maybe we don't hire by location, but we hire by time zone and keep mm -hmm. people aligned. There was an article in Fast Company last week on uh, hiring by time zone. That's really interesting. And uh, if you have these different things that are, again, a work platform, it's an ecosystem, and this might be one of the tools. And then we come together as a group, you know, on a quarterly basis. Um, Ryan Chesney from Airbnb, he is literally working out of Airbnbs and not having a home for like six months right now because yeah. he can, and he goes anywhere he needs to. Who else is gonna take this model? And so I think that um, just the business agility and the unknowns and how do we plan for unknowns with the most flexibility yeah. is kind of what I've taken away from the last two years. Yeah, how yeah. we learn to play. Yeah. yeah, and it's gonna differ from you know company to company too. Oh, you absolutely. Know, yeah, how they're projecting like next year, the next two years, next ten years. You know, so it's yeah, how can we be smarter about design and our space? giving our employees everything that they need at the same time. Yeah, really interesting. Do you have a question there, Alex? We've got, yeah, the virtual audience is coming to light. So we've got a question on the, from Kavitha, as on Zoom, asking about amenities. How effective is the strategy of implementing amenities and how do you differentiate between the gimmicks and the effective amenities? Which you can share on that. So I'll speak up on that. Um, one of the things I need, think you need to know is you need to know your user population. It goes back to the user experience, right? So what are the things that motivate them? Uh, the last six months, I've heard a lot of things around wellness. So is my building health, uh, health um, safety rated within either FitWell or the Well standard? Um, what kind of commutation options do I have? Uh, do I have a bike room in my building or not? Um, it, there, there's the typical things like, you know, the, the bodega in the basement or the, or the first floor or, you know, the stair steps that are owned by the building that you can share them across everything. But it's also about health and wellness and uh, transparency of information. Uh, do I have sensors on my floor plan? So I like it 73 degrees. That corner is 73. I want to sit over there versus that corner. Um, what about my air quality? There's all these other things around health and wellness that are really about good operational functionality, but the transparency of it is a huge amenity that I think employees are, are really fighting for right now. Yeah, it's not like a one size fits all solution um, to you know our assets. So it's it's really a direct correlation to what our tenants asking for in that specific neighborhood location. You know, wellness is a huge thing, yeah. um, especially you know with uh, the filtration, the the mer filters, all that sort of thing. Like yeah. the tenants are actually asking specifics on that. I recently talked to a, 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 a Gabriel a product developer. Uh, he's developed a HVAC diffuser that sits over the workstation, and it's like in the aircraft, where it's that bundle of air right over you. I've seen, yeah, yeah. I've seen and that, he yeah. can get five degrees different temperature between two people sitting next wow. to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, are you going to get this kind of individual control that you can control through your phone on an app? Or how you like it and the other person likes it which also contributes to your net zero impact because you're using less energy because people are changing it to their own instead of fighting over the thermostat you know right. if that number one too hot if the number two issue is too cold and they've been just for the last 34 years yeah. Yeah. i would also say too and you know this will sound familiar based on how i've been speaking so far like amenity amenity can be more than just the like spaces that are provided it can be programming. Uh, I was at RxR, a big landlord here in New York City, for a couple of years, and we built out a community team who owns 
the you know production and the development of community outreach events uh, partnerships things like that and bring that to the entire portfolio so there are a lot of things to play around with that don't require swimming hammers um, and those things I think will always naturally happen given the space yeah. that we are in but it can be complemented by rather than just sort of taking a field of dreams mentality of like we're going to build it and then people will come and use it have a reason for people to come and you know be there like you are organizing the reason um, and then you know people can then get creative oh maybe I want to have a meeting that's here or you know I can't wait for the next event that they're going to host in this kind of space things like that back to your earlier point it allows the alpha the beta yes the, all the different iterations of testing to find out what's effective over time too yes. because you're not having this huge project that is going to cost millions and millions and millions yes. of dollars how do we how do we tweak things over time yeah. to make it effective? It's also like low key change management all the way along too. Like it brings people along for whatever ride you're constructing. Of you know, we're building this new amenity package for our entire portfolio. This is the first piece that's going to be ready, and we're going to be hosting an event with you know a, one of our F and B tenants, and they're going to host like a wine tasting or whatever. Like there are very easy ways to on the landlord side pull from your own portfolio to create something that's beneficial to like more than one party uh, and I think we are going to continue to see more and more creativity like that from the landlord side because they do have stuff to buffer as they swing hammers and invest millions and millions of dollars and so how do we get air cover for that because people will just be like waiting I want this thing how do you you know create a level of patience by engaging them very interesting any questions out in the audience so while we're thinking on that, I've got a LinkedIn live question from Gabrielle who's asking what concrete changes do you see in the design of offices, the fewer fit outs that have actually happened since the pandemic started? One of the things that I've developed is a top down programming tool. It used to be where it was butts and seats. So you had so many or so many seats, and that meant I would have so many conference rooms, and that would kind of work itself up from that. Instead, what we're doing is, okay, I have uh, an office in New York City that's going to support 300 people. Of those 300 people, how much is my typical occupancy load at a peak time? Not Monday morning at 8 a.m., but like Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock. What's my average peak load? So then you right size it for the office, but then you think about when they're coming to the office, the destination. So you start to distribute that to the different activities that we've been talking about that you're going to be doing. And then once you look at those different activities, then you start to develop the space types that you're going to have for those peak environments. And so it kind of takes it from uh, a workflow programming versus a work uh, about and seats kind of programming, which is I think is a new way uh, for us to be thinking about how we deliver space. I think that's how we start to hopefully adopt like whatever the 21st century version of ABW is. Yeah. Like, you know, all those principles I think are still very tried and true, but the implementation of them and now because we have a better conceptual understanding of what it means to find a spot that is best for the kind of activity that's at hand, yeah. we are better use we are now enabled to be better users of activity based working than ever before. So we, we've actually modeled this uh, in two installations in Salt Lake City, um, yeah, Salt Lake City and in Bristol. Uh, and so we're actually hoping to get some post occupancy evaluation here pretty soon with Spacer. So <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, check out the uh, project profiles on our website. Beautiful project. <laughs> but but there's new ways to be thinking about how to provide space yeah. that is again. This is like the golden era for us to reinvent ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just you know looking at different user types, you know the very private kind of heads down work all the way to the very like open, collaborative, more public type spaces, and just like. Where do different companies, what are they looking for? How are their employees interacting with other groups within that company as well? So it's, you know, it's a lot of variety. It's a lot of um, flexibility, but also just being nimble too. It's interesting because I, I have a large financial client that I work with and we had this conversation in 2019 and he was telling me they have a campus that's about 400,000 square foot campus. So that any given day of the week, I was at 58% occupancy. So I'm looking at that going, Okay, you're telling me that was then, where yeah. are we now? Yeah. Um, that becomes, you know, that's a lot of real estate. And their their big push is to come, you know, they want to become more of a tech of a lot of a tech aligned company. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see, you know, if you were only ever at fifty eight percent, how do we actually get you up to twenty five, thirty percent? 
It's a different question. Yeah. What's the energy level you want in the space? That's because exactly. then you, what you need to do is you need to look at capacity. Like if I'm if I have 100 seats, what capacity do I want to be at? Do I want to be at 75 percent? So what's my sharing ratio that I need to reverse engineer into that so I can create that kind of level of energy and buzz when people come to the office? Yeah. And even even clicking into that further, uh, regardless of where seats are, just if you take 450 thousand square feet and divide it by let's say 5,000 people showed up, how many square feet per person is enormous. It's like thousands and thousands of square feet per person. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, and so like what is you know, using that math of combined averages of like your top peak days and then also looking at um, you know the overall average just to see like what's your what's your range that you need to support? Yeah. What is the typical that you need to support and then what's the max, what's the surge that I need to support? And that's a completely way, different way of configuring an environment. And you know, again, with the butts and seats, thank God we are getting away from that. But um, the, the other piece too is, uh, what are just the basic things that every single worker needs, regardless of whether you're an engineer, which is like shorthand for your introverted and don't like talking to people, or you're in sales and you can't live without talking to people. Like, what are just the main and the basic things that everyone needs? We need power. We need Wi-Fi. We, you know, this is like a combination of, you know, very brass tacks, like you know, facility sort of punch list plus. Um, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or, or sort of like the, the well building standard of we need natural light and we need you know plants that are purifying for the air and things like that. So it's sort of creating this confluence of all these different inputs that we know in different spheres and making them work together because all these basic things we need to solve first before we start to specialize into what does a, what does a designer need? What does um, what does an EA need? What does an executive need? Like, because that then becomes so subjective. We've got to figure out the basics. You're right. You have to have those those pillars, but yes. it comes down to autonomy and choice. That's it goes right. back to, uh, you know, how do you engage employees? Yeah. How do you do that? And it goes back to uh, Daniel Pink's book, Drive, from back in the day, yeah. about mastery, autonomy, and choice that really enables people to be in charge of their own destiny. Yeah. And, um, that's that, that, the, the pillars that allow you to, to make those choices, right. whether you have issues around neurodiversity or people on the spectrum versus um, you know diversity within the space. Yeah. So all that, it's very compelling. It's, yeah. it, it's just, These are good problems. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't think anybody would stop and just say, you know, we're, we're facing this monumental crisis with our workplace. I think just to, you know, being able to experiment and actually Hit the reset button and say, "Okay, we're gonna okay, let's try again." And you know, take a uh, phrase from our friends at PwC. They often say, "You know, we're gonna fail. It's fail fast, but fail forward." Mm -hmm. And I think that's you know, even um, you know, the C-suite they need to acknowledge we're not gonna get it right every time. We're not. You know, we're we're making changes, but being able to bake flexibility into a floor plan and into our thinking yeah. is gonna. You know, so whenever the next challenge arises, we have the ability to be flexible. Um, again, we can have any questions if anybody want to ask them. Yeah, I have one question um, involving, uh, do you all ever foresee any kind of negatives or cons to the flexibility layout? Because I read once upon a time that the cubicle when it first was iterated in the space, it would I think factor element into it. It was progressive for the time, but then it became like a nightmare. For most workers, do you see that happening now? Uh, possibly with a flexible workspace, like the so the biggest much. the biggest negative on the the flexibility is um, if you it, it almost provides more resiliency. The more resiliency you have, the higher cost you have. So now you have some costs that you're investing right now for these this resiliency of flexibility, right? Um, so you're doing that right now. Um, so because there's a value prop, there's enough drivers that made it compelling. So there could be, because never say never, I've learned that in my life. <laughs> but, but I think that a lot of those issues, because there's such a compelling need right now, people are seeing the value long term. Um, I, I would look to what's been done in Europe, right? Yeah. They had raised floors and demountable partitions forever. And when you reconfigure an office in Europe, 
you can do it in much like half the time uh, with a lot more diversity. And then people will spend 10 or 20 percent of their money in the reception area to make it bespoke and custom. So I, I see a lot more of that kind of mentality in our future. If it's going to be exactly the same range floor and a multiple petition, that's that's all for conversations. The bottom line is agility. I would also say even outside of the built environment, we have more options of where we can work than yeah. when the cuticle came into existence. The cuticle was where work was done full stop. We can now work from home, we can work from a coffee shop, we can work from an airplane should we choose. So because we have all these different options, I think it actually does um, take a lot of the pressure off of the success of this because we can, we've got a lot of other geographical pieces that we can play around with, with where work happens. So at yeah, least yeah. I'm hoping that that's the case, but also never say never. And that really points up the need for good tech. Yeah, one hundred percent. Digital work is just as important as physical process. There's going to be stuck there forever, but <laughs> we don't have that. Um, question on the back there. You know, I mean, it kind of relates to this. Um, we talked a lot about geography and you know, what that means for a workplace. I'm working with a really large tech client at forty offices across the world, and their new stance is that employees have to come to the office three days a week. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which office they go to. So if the employee in New York decides they want to go to London, they can go to London three days a week. Um, so I think from a design standpoint, as we're being challenged, how do we make the workplace, A, accessible, right? If you're from London, what does the workplace look like, like if you're in New York? Are you going to have those same amenities with raised floors and movable furniture? And then, um, you know, B, how do you scale, right? How do you decide how much square foot per office? How do we measure how many employees are going to come? Maybe they can go to New York and the in the summer and they go to Florida in the winter. So how do you kind of design for that? So the way that we've done it in our future of work is we've done that top-down programming of kind of trying to understand what our peak load is going to be. Um, now there's going to be some days where it's going to be, you know, like like church on Easter, Easter morning. It's just going to be all hands on deck kind of thing. And you recognize you're going to have two or three times a year it's going to be that. And that's the reality of it because you're trying to get an even average peak. And then if you, you learn over time through data analytics that your peak is actually here where you thought it was here, then that's where you see there's an, it's worth the investment to add more space. Or you might be, maybe we sequester this off and, and see if we can do some you know, third party uh, solution there with, with that space. But I think you're gonna see a lot more incorporation about you using utilization data on an ongoing monthly or biannual basis for looking at your real estate opportunities that was not done before now. It's like in APAC, they have uh, one year rent renewals every single year on their lease terms. Uh, and, and I don't know if we'll get to that extreme. I mean, on, on the landlord side, you might have better insights to that, but. Yeah, we're, we're actually, yeah, initially we were seeing tenants looking, reevaluating the real estate and reducing size. And now we're seeing that people are looking to increase their real estate needs yeah. um, because they can't predict um, with this hybrid model, like which days, like if a company is like, you have to come in three days a week, well, which days? Like, are people who come in, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Monday, Fridays are essentially empty? It's like, we can't really plan for that. And so a lot of companies are like, well, actually, I probably need a little bit more space to just, you know, um, take into account, like, an uptake of people coming in. Have you seen any of your tenants, like, collaborating with each other to say, hey, let's have this floor in between us, and you come down or I go up and kind of, have you seen a lot of ownership of individual no, I have not seen tenants that. doing that? Because I'm that curious if that might be yeah. a picture. On that never say never. Yeah, never say never. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you just give a pretty good new idea. I like it. One thing I thought was really interesting right at the beginning of the pandemic, which I'd never seen before, is clients came to me and said, look, we, want, we know you work with this company and this company and this company. We would always want to have their own space be the, the cool thing. And they all of a sudden wanted to talk to one another and learn what are you trying, what are you thinking, to get people together, sharing ideas, and it was super inspiring to, to see that kind of change. We don't need to do our own thing and be on our own lane, let's do it together. Yeah, it's, it's, I think we're in an interesting moment because I think, again, as we, we and all the executives and real estate leaders, we're moving more in this direction of space as a tool, space as a platform, like space as a platform on which work happens. Uh, we might see companies get less precious about the designs and the features that they put in to make that happen because then it just it becomes more unilateral rather than like oh well this is what google does we're going to keep it quiet unless you're a google employee or you design the space for us and things like that who knows might be might be the case but because 
we are in this moment where no one really knows and so everyone is clamoring for whatever like bit of insight or data that we can just move with i think you're right like we can see there's going to be a lot of interesting sharing that goes on more than just sort of like the post project look at these beautiful beautiful photos of, of, of stage space and things like that there's going to be more of like we design this with this intention and this is how it's performing it's more about the value prop now exactly you know, we i was looking at a, a national bank and looking at their their retail branch um, and we said, well, if you reconfigure your spaces to allow for the meeting rooms only to be meetings, and so somebody owning that room, and you allow that agility for working remote or being there and for your meetings, you can increase your meeting time or your meeting numbers by 50%. And that's where they make their revenue. That caught their attention. So it's about the value prop and how you have to reposition the information so that they understand why they're investing in whatever design they're investing in. And, and to your point, it might become very bespoke in small areas, yeah. and then 80 percent, 80 20. Yep. You know, 80 percent of it's going to become a little bit more generic. 20 percent is going to become a lot more specialized. And at the end of the day, we as workers need a lot of the same stuff. So 80 20 is not a like the genericism is not bad. Yeah, it just shows how workers are workers, and we all need different or we all need similar things at different rates and for different like for different specific activities. But you know, yeah. space. There's only so many different ways that you can design a space with the intention of it being a focused space or a collaborative space. Yeah, there's only so many pieces of product that you put out. Desk is still a desk. Yeah, and, 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 and a chair is still where you put your yeah, desk. Yeah, <laughs> that hasn't changed. So in our final few minutes here, Alex, do we have any other questions that have come in that need answering? There the, the, some great feedback from uh, the previous comments, but also one of the questions that we have is crystal ball there, please. What, where, 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 <laughs> Full or close to full occupancy, will we ever see that again? And it may be off. My, my I, I would turn around. Why does that matter? I was going to say, yeah, also define full occupancy. Yeah, yeah, what's full occupancy actually mean? I, I would turn that around and say, if it's about the user experience, does that matter? I mean, do yeah. you enjoy going someplace that has really high energy level? Then, then do that. If you don't, then maybe you need to self select for other things. And, and um, yeah. I think we're going to have higher occupancy than we have today. Right. Put that up. Yes, one hundred percent. Especially in larger cities where you have to issue with, have issues of mass transit and concerns over, um, you know, any surge or variance or whatever that might be. But that being said, I think that we've been, you know, um, the U.S. US Bureau of Labor Statistics said that we increased our productivity three percent during COVID. And this is the government saying this. This isn't me trying to yeah, these are economists just like looking at data. Um, so if you can prove people can be just as effective wherever they are, then why are you restricting them and not giving them autonomy and choice? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think occupancy or even utilization are the the, the numbers we should be desiring. They tell us something. Oh, check. They, exactly. They point us in a certain direction, but they are not. They they shouldn't be the goal. We shouldn't be seeking. You know. X percent, X percent of headcount in the office or anything like that. We should be focusing on um, employee engagement. And so <laughs> are people coming or are they going? You know, it's so it's that tail of attraction. It's the yeah, tail of attraction. It does come back to it all, all circle again. Yeah. I mean, unemployment. It, that's one of the healthy numbers coming out of the out exactly. of the economy right now. It's the unemployment rate and. That's what we had prior to the pandemic, yeah. and I think that's probably one thing that if we look at and say, you know, let's you know, move occupancy to the side, yeah. let's actually look at our workforce, yeah. how is our workforce performing, um, and how are we engaging with our employees. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, you know, like we were saying, all executives are worried about the culture and the social fabric of their people, but it's in... It, it, they already said the word. It's about the social element of their company. It's not about the work element of their company. Company, like yeah, everyone's being especially productive. We need to figure out how to let people be together in just ways that are not about hands being on keyboard or workshopping or anything like that. Like they, we need, we, yes, they put out that article that talked about if you have somebody you worked with before, mm -hmm. you are actually four times closer to that person post pandemic than before. Yes, like your secondary, your tertiary relationships, the, the water cooler uh, talk, that is is the inverse 
that you're not connecting with those people. So that's why corporations are so concerned about how do we create a culture of sticking this factor to bring people in. And that's where companies are focused yeah. right now. And bringing people back for three days a week is not the solve. It's what you might be bringing to them for the days that they are in the office. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's been a very interesting topic. I trust all of you have taken away something, some points here. Um, but I really want to thank you all. I think we're right at, right at the hour mark here. Um, so yes, thank you very much for coming out and sharing your insights with us. Um, we will be doing this again, hopefully around Neocon in um, June, and then we thought we'll continue to engage in conversation because I think it's a very interesting topic and who knows where we'll be in six months time. <laughs> we'll be, yeah, we'll have a big blizzard. And <laughs> You know, that's the biggest problem with this. We don't get snow days anymore. Like, we used to get snow that's days. That's the biggest like, problem. I was like, hey, you, <laughs> you might get mental health days, so if you're lucky. There we go. I'll take that. Um, just a day off the relapse. But no, I think it's really interesting topic. And really appreciate your insights. Yeah. Um, this is something that our clients, as Joe was saying, and a lot of our clients have even come to us and said, you know, what are your what are your other customers? You know, what your other customers doing? And it's actually turned into this. This is really why we started this Insights Live is to share these ideas. So thank you again, and thank you to our audience. Thank you for being uh, participating, and thank you to those online that have joined us and for all your questions. I look forward to the next round. Thank you.